Welcome once more, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another edition of Ask Oki Live. Today we have a very distinguished guest. I refer to him not only as a scholar and a gentleman, but as an aficionado of life. Um, a gentleman who I generally have referred to uh, on my private blog as my intellectual godfather. Um, very well deserved, if I might add. Uh, a very well-read man um, in every sense of the word. Uh, I have lived in his library and I have borrowed books from his library that have yet to be returned. Uh, but uh, I am a better man without a doubt uh, for having uh, had the good fortune of, uh, of uh, making an acquaintance with uh, our guest today. A little backstory on how we met. Uh, we met at a musical recital where both uh, our kids uh, were in attendance as musicians. Uh, my son, older son, is a clarinetist. He plays the clarinet. And uh, your daughter, I believe, plays the trumpet. trumpet. And they were part of uh, an orchestra. And uh, during one of the breaks, uh, both my sons walked up to me and said, hey, dad. Uh, we saw someone who looks just like you. I looked around, I'm like, well, that can't be possible because uh, I'm the only black person here. <laughs> and they pointed to the gentleman standing in the corner. I turned around, and there you had this gentleman uh, dressed just impeccably in a dark navy blazer and uh, a coral-colored pair of full-cut uh, trousers. I proceeded to walk up to him. I introduced myself. And then I uh, complimented him on his uh, very well-tailored uh, clothes. And uh, there began a friendship uh, that has lasted uh, three years. And, and I hope, uh, I look forward, and I hope will last many more. Mm -hmm. And so without further ado, let me hand the mic over to Pete uh, to spend about two minutes uh, or so, uh, just giving us a very high-level introduction of, of who he is and uh, sharing some tidbits. Uh, before we delve into the meat of the matter, into the main dialogue. Pete, thank you. Okay. welcome to Studio One. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for a very, very flattering introduction. I'm not sure I can live up to it, but I'll do my best, at least for the next hour or so. As Oki says, we met at the concert. I was equally pleased to be able to meet somebody here in Abu Dhabi who's, who knows about cut and drape, and fabric, and all of that sort of thing, and also has an extraordinarily wide range of interests. So we sit and chat periodically, and it, the time just passes. I've been here for 30 years. I have a small consulting business, which I run with my wife here in Abu Dhabi. Um, before Abu Dhabi, I was in Saudi Arabia, and long before that, I was in London, and I grew up in the west of Canada. I have a wife, as I said, two daughters, one grandson, and about 40 nieces and nephews. And I can't think of anything else to say of any interest to anybody right at the moment. <laughs> okay, very good. All righty then. I know you do have a lot to say, so uh, you're just keeping your introduction brief. So let's get right into it. Um, I have a number of questions uh, for you, Pete, but uh, let's, let's start with the blog, our private blog of which you've been a member for the last three years, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. since we met. Um, what has been your experience on the blog? Well, the blog is an interesting thing, or interesting place, I suppose you could say, because it covers, it covers everything from cars to girls to suits to philosophy, to latterly or recently, um, rap music. And you, so you can generally find something that's going to interest you. You can find people who do all kinds of different things. It, the ages range from probably, I'm probably the oldest one on there. And then you've maybe got not. quite a number of, <laughs> sorry? Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. And you've got uh, quite a lot of the younger generation on there. And what I like about it is that whenever you go on to it, somebody's going to be saying something that either 
something you didn't know before, or something you know about, and here's a new angle on it. And as I said, okay, I think it's the, it's the variety that makes it interesting. Some of the topics are extremely arcane. A couple of years ago, we had a sort of foray into the intricacies of option trading and financing, and there was a series of very interesting lectures given by none other than our host on that subject. Um, and so it's clothes, it's, as I said, cars, watches recently, rap music, if you're into that sort of thing. And it kind of has a life of its own, built by the members and sort of gently steered by the host. That's the way I would look at it. Right. Gently right. steered. Now, here's a question for you, Pete. How do you think as we go, as we move to the broader stage, um, I, I should, I hasten to add that, uh, the private blog I have kept for seven years or so. I think I did mention this in the introductory video, and it's uh, it's been it's essentially a ring fence WhatsApp blog uh, by invitation only, and it's grown over the years. Mm -hmm. And the idea initially was clothing to talk mm -hmm. about clothing, and then as more people joined, we sought to accommodate a wider audience mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. expanding the range of subjects we discussed in the blog to include finance, like you said. Um, art, uh, <coughs> geopolitics, yep. uh, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, we are at an inflection point where we're moving from a private platform mm -hmm. to a public platform. What are your thoughts on how this affects the dynamic, uh, the camaraderie especially, that we've been able to develop over the years on this private blog? Well, you'll always have the camaraderie among the people who were there at the beginning. So they'll all know each other. And as you attract more and more people to it, for whatever reason, they will, or some of them, will kind of conglomerate onto the camaraderie that's there. Some of them will lurk on the sidelines forever. And you'll notice with forums and blogs is that the followership comes and goes. So you'll have intense periods when there are a lot of new people coming in. And then you'll notice some of the old hands will sort of drift away. They get busy, they get married, they move the house or they have some kids or whatever happens and they don't have enough time to spend on it. Or they just get interested in other things. And I don't think it's a criticism of the blog. It's just that's just the way life goes. Right. So you get new people in. And I think people would be attracted to join either by the topics and the fact that they can get information, insights on the blog that they can't get anywhere else, or they, they feel that they've got something to say and here's a place to say it. Right. And here's an audience for them. Right. Now, what do you think as we transition the blog away from WhatsApp to Slack or mm -hmm. Discord, mm -hmm. uh, we're still sort of deciding what yeah. platform to use, or actually having the blog on Askoki, the portal itself. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as the main challenges in terms of transitioning um, mm. and bringing and attracting new members? Well, I think the thing about any, any place on the internet, the question would be from somebody sitting on his phone or his computer, would be, where am I and why am I here? And what am I going to get here? Or what am I going to do here? So the question, where am I, is, well, you're on a, you're on a forum. OK, well, why am I here? Well, you're interested in one of the topics that the forum me channels have. So you have a, a watch channel, you have a, or a watch page, and you have a shoes page, and a shirts page, and an overcoats page, and so forth. So you, you go to those, depending on what you're interested in that morning or in particular. And then as the blog, as it goes through time, you add special pages because you realize that, well, leather jackets is a bit of a thing on its own, so let's put something for that and so forth. I think that the challenge is this question, where am I and why am I here? They got to know precisely where they are. Now, if you take something like Fedora Lounge, you know why you're there. You know where you are, you know why you're there. It's essentially to trade stories and to trade information mm -hmm. with people who, who want hats or who want 
um, raincoats or watches, and a huge variety of things, but that's, that's what you're doing there. The difficult part, I think, is answering that question as you, when you go into the public. Because for the members that are on now, it doesn't really matter because we all know why we're there. And it's based around the host. When people come on who, who, who know not the host, then the blog itself has to be able to communicate that. And then I think people, as I said, they, they contribute or they, or they just sort of suck up information or they get into interesting discussions with individual members, and, and it goes from there. Yeah. That, that's how I would look at that. Very good, Pete. Now let's get into the broader subjects. I'm, we're going to break this up into two sections. One, we'll talk about our favorite subject, <laughs> our favorite mutual subject, <laughs> classic <laughs> dress. Right. And then the second part, I, I want to sort of get a little bit, dig a little bit deep. Uh, you, we've shared a lot of philosophy texts. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, a lot mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. I have uh, borrowed from your library. Um, so. We were just discussing an Abbasis mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in my library over there by Xenophone before mm -hmm. we came on the set. And so the second part of this uh, discourse uh, is going to be talking about just life in mm -hmm, general mm -hmm. and applying perhaps some of the principles and lessons uh, you and I have learned uh, in our deep study uh, Certainly, your deep study and uh, and my own study of philosophy um, and how that has influenced us as as an, or shaped us mm -hmm. as individuals, mm -hmm. um, or rather shaped you as an individual mm -hmm. because today it's all about you. So we'll start with clothing. Um, how did you develop your taste uh, for clothing? How did you approach it? Um, you know, what were the various sources, ideas? Uh, did you have role models, people that you modeled yourself after? Uh, did you have sort of references, mm -hmm. uh, things like apparel arts or, you know, some of these books that sit here? Mm -hmm. What was your approach and when did this begin? Golly, okay. That's a loaded question, isn't it? It's, it's no, 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 that, <laughs> let me just pull it together here. So, my grandfather, my mother's father, I never knew my father's father. He died before I was born. My mother's father was from the east end of London, and I knew him as, as an old man, but he was invariably in a suit, with a waistcoat, tie, and a pair of spats. And this was in the mid-1960s, when I, as a small boy, first started to notice what was around me, and this is something I noticed. And I remember a seeing a picture of him at the seaside with my mother when she was probably about five, so this would have been in the mid-thirties. And there he was at the seaside, and what was he wearing? A Panama, a tie, a waistcoat. He'd taken off his jacket as a concession to the occasion, and his trousers were rolled up. He was standing in the sea. And I thought, golly Moses, that's a model to follow. Uh, I also have an uncle, still with us, who was extremely dapper, I think is the word that I would use. And I remember references to him from my father. And he would compare people whose picture he saw to his brother, my uncle. The third real influence was when I was probably about 14, I saw a film on the television called Invisible Stripes with George Raft. And I thought, crikey, that's a sharp-looking guy. And so I went to the library and looked at some photographs of this guy, George Raft, who was an actor. The younger generation won't know who he was, but he was an actor, and he was well-known well for being extremely well-dressed. And I guess that was the role model. So there are three role models. You'll be interested to know that I still have... So it wasn't Cary Grant. No, it wasn't Cary Grant. No, no, no. I've had any interest in Cary Grant. Cary Grant looked... Obviously very elegant, but rather, compared to George Raft, rather dull. George Raft was much more, what you call, a bit of a spiv, really. But uh, you'll be interested to know... And what's a spiv, a dandy? A, a wide boy. Someone who maybe grew up on the wrong side of town. Mm. And looks a little bit too well-dressed. Mm -hmm. But that was George Raft, with very, very high waist, very narrow waist, very wide shoulders... Um, 
the archetypical the, the, the archetypical 1930s figure the the the, the Schalt figure or shot figure right. you know and uh, you will be interested to know that I still have a pair of my grandfather's spats and when I or if I reach the age of 80 I'm going to start wearing them and Oki and I have a running <laughs> gag on this subject where he's said to me frequently I can't wait to see that so they're still there in the cupboard waiting waiting patiently to be to be worn once again I'll, so pay, good, I'll, pay, I'll pay good money for that <laughs> Very good, Pete. Now, let's talk about clothing in the contemporary sure, sense. Sure, sure, um, sure. When you look at the contemporary landscape, what do you see, you know, who are the, who would you consider well-dressed? And, and when I say contemporary, I don't mean uh, in the Instagram sense, right? Okay. So let's okay. go back, you know, feel free to go back mm -hmm. as far back as Alan Fusser uh, or some of the, uh, let's say, from the 80s and 90s. Right, uh, okay. some of the weather, uh, just common citizens or sure. people who are in sure. the trade. Okay. Um, who are who? Who would you consider well dressed? Well, you for a start. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not included. <laughs> His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Okay. Uh, in the current Prince of Wales. Oh yes, I invariably, extremely well dressed. Um, Charlie Watts, the late Charlie Watts. Musician. The musician, the, the, the drummer from Rolling Stones. Um, Bill Nye, the actor, always extremely well turned out in a suit, you know, or a jacket. But Charlie Watts really, really was extremely sharp, as was uh, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, by the way. In terms of sort of contemporary sports figures or actors or people, I, don't, I can't think of anybody. Actually, in the current day, no, no, I, I don't know of anybody who. I'm trying to think who really strikes me, as somebody who's thought about. How am I going to look? How does this make me look? And has actually put some effort into it. In the way that, say, Cary Grant would have done, mm -hmm. because you see, somebody like Cary Grant, his whole point was. I'm so well dressed that I'm I don't even look well dressed anymore. In other words, it, it's just there. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of that that's the way that Prince Charles looks. Mm -hmm. In the now, sense now, that now, now let me let me interject, let me interject there. Um I think I I mean just some of the names that you threw out, uh, there's there's certainly uh there's a there's you know, there's a narrative there, right? Which the the contemporary or sort of the present day uh, dresses might consider a little bit anachronistic. True, true, right, true. Yes, um, yes, yes. And there's always that challenge of trying to find the right balance between, you know, maintaining a classic sense of dress, mm -hmm. however, uh, avoiding that uh, cloud mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, yes, yes, let's yes, say, yes. appearing. Yes. Um, some would even say, uh, clownish is not the word for it, but costumed. Uh, costumed. Yes. That is the yes. right word yes. for it. Yes. So, what would you tell the younger generation, uh, for instance, some of the younger ones on the mm -hmm. blog in their 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. that want to avoid this look or sort of this yes. cast? Yes. How, how, would you, how would you advise them to approach classic dress? Well, I think that for the, for the younger guys who are in their 20s and 30s, they're lucky in a sense because the whole clothing scene is so fragmented now that you don't have somebody like Edward VIII, the Prince of Wales, who's sort of the, the role model, the mm -hmm. marker for everybody. So that the younger guys have much more opportunity to do what they want. So for example, if you wear a brown suit, in, in town, which um, 30, 40 years ago you couldn't have done, you probably can do that now and get away with it. So they've You got, mean like I'm wearing now? Well, no, that's... <laughs> we're not really in town, as it were. But you could, you could actually wear a brown suit yeah. in... Possibly not in London, in the city, but certainly in, in many cities. Now, I think what you've got to avoid 
is looking like you're dressed up. It's got to look natural. So if everybody else is wearing um, just a, a sports jacket and an open neck shirt, you don't want to show up in morning dress or, you know, in a stiff suit with, with a, a, a celluloid, a detachable celluloid collar or something. You've got, to, you've got to blend in. What makes the difference is whatever it is that you're wearing, is it a good color? Have you chosen the colors so that they stand out a little bit, sort of show off your own natural color? Have you chosen the fabric so that it's got an interesting sort of a weave to it, a little bit of a, a little bit of a texture to it? Have you had it cut so that it suits your shape? In other words, if you're sort of like Oki, does it fit you properly or does it tend to pull away at the chest? You don't want that. In other words, does it look like you've taken the time to put it together without looking as though you spent three hours traveling around a closet trying to pick out what would be exactly right to wear for the occasion? And I think it's that ability to look effortless that has distinguished well-dressed men in the past and will always continue to do so. So even if it's jeans and your hoodie or jeans and a leather jacket, does it fit you? If you've got very, very thin legs and you're wearing very thin, tight jeans, it might be an idea to think, oh, is there some way I could maybe look less like a couple of cigarettes walking along, you know? If you're, on the other hand, sort of slightly bell-shaped, you might think, well, is it really wise to wear very, very tight trousers, which make me look like a pregnant chicken, which has been plucked and then painted blue? And it's that ability to, to see yourself and to see, what, to see yourself from the outside, as it were, I think that makes all the difference. And that's the advice I would give to the younger generation, is take a look at yourself. And, and give it some thought. But above all, get the cut and the fit right that, that suits you. And then don't go for anything that's too of the moment. So for example, avoid those very, very, very thin lapels. And at the same time, avoid you know, the, the bat wing lapels of the 70s. So that in 10 years time, that same jacket will never look out of place. And, and I think, Oki, you would agree with me on that. I think that's something we would both, we both agree on. Excellent. Well, uh, I would be remiss if I did not uh, uh, pull out one of your favorite uh, quotes or references. Uh, uh, <laughs> I used to have the body of a Greek god, yeah, but, <laughs> but now I... Uh, and now have a body of a goddamn Greek. That's right. Yes, 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 yes. yes I think. Uh, and yeah, I, think this I almost is... fell out of my chair the first time really? I heard How you. Really? Okay. <laughs> but I think this is where the bespoke world is the obvious choice. Most of us are not built like Clark Kent or Oki or the man from the Rocky Horror Show that that Frankenfurter was was creating. You know, most of us don't have that physique. And most clothes that you buy, especially jackets, pants, um, shirts to an extent, most clothes that you buy in shops are designed for a, a one-size-fits-all, cookie-cutter kind of a guy. And nobody really ever looks quite his best in them. And this is where I think maybe, if not bespoke, made to measure, where you can actually get something that looks a little bit original. And that's another thing, Oki, that I think I would advise for the guys in their 20s and 30s. They say, look, your clothes are a fantastic way to make an impression. They're portable. You can, you can always carry them with you. It's not like a car. You may have a very, very nice car, but where does it go? It goes in a garage. It's not like everybody can see you in that car <clears throat> all the time. And in fact, they can't because you might have tinted windows. But your clothes, wherever you go, people can see you. And so it's an opportunity for people to recognize you and to, to kind of know you as that one 
but always somehow looks really well put together. So it gives you the opportunity to be a little bit original and in a sense to look, yeah, not out of place, but not quite like all the other guys as well. Very good, very good. Pete, before we go, uh, move on from clothing, <clears throat> I want us to touch on the commercial side of things. Yes, yes. Uh, so we've talked about just personal style, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. developing your sense of style and sort of developing your own sense of self, mm -hmm. uh, getting comfortable with clothing and defining yourself indeed uh, with your choice of, mm -hmm, of clothes. Mm -hmm. Now, I want us to talk a little bit more um, about the commercial side of things, both on both ends. Okay. So both on the demand side and on the supply mm -hmm, side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, when I say demand side, of course, I mean sort of from a buyer's perspective, yep. from yep. a customer perspective. And then we'll also look at the supply side, meaning sort of the industry as, yep. it, as it is today and the challenges that plague okay. the industry and where you see the industry going in the future. Yep. So uh, where do you want to start? Do you want to start from the front or from the back? It's up to you. <laughs> okay. Let's start from the, um, let's start from the back. Because we just talked about customers, we talked about buying clothes or choosing. So let's talk a little bit back about the mechanics of the back end. Um, what are the current ch challenges that you see that plague the industry? Um, and what are the opportunities that could arise from these challenges? Well, the industry, if you take the garment industry as a whole, is quite diverse. You've got let's say you've got H&M at one end and you've got Jeeves and Hawks at the other end. So what do we have in the middle? Well, we have a range of prices. We have a range of styles and designs. We have a range of demographic segments. We have a range of income segments. And I think there are two things. One is that people have got very, very accustomed to getting things immediately. So you walk into a shop, there it is on the rack, you look at it, you pull it off the rack, and there it's yours. Now that's been with us for a long time, there's no doubt about that. But I used to be, and I remember this myself, you might, in Canada when I was growing up, you go into a department store, and you'd go over to the man, because it was always a man those days, go over to the man and you'd say, I want a suit, and he'd show you the suits. And you would never take the suit out of the shop. It would always be altered in the shop for you. So there was no way you were going to walk in in the morning and wear the same suit out to dinner that night. And I think the, the idea of things being instantly available and very, very cheap and almost disposable to the extent that you'll buy something this week and it'll go into a bag or into a cupboard and, and in a couple of years you'll clean out the cupboard and just throw it out. This is very useful for large-scale mass market merchants, obviously. And this is the planned obsolescence thing is, is what they would like to have. Up at the other end, you have the bespoke world. And the bespoke world today is, aside from the fact that, as we've talked about, you have tailoring houses that have tried to, tried to transform themselves from being what were effectively small artisanal businesses into global brands, and that's a very fraught subject, I think. Aside from that, you've still got bespoke houses doing what bespoke houses were doing 100 years ago, which is somebody walks in, they measure him, they've got a choice of fabrics, the tailor advises him, says, well, this would look nice on you, sir, and how about this, this is a check, it looks a little bit sporty, would you like a dark blue, where are you going to wear it, and all of that sort of thing, a bit of consulting. And he measures you, you go in for a fitting, and out comes a suit that makes you look decent and accomplishes what we were talking about earlier. Now, the, the industry can tolerate or can accommodate both of those. With global travel, it's meant that the bespoke houses, say in London, have customers from all over the world who fly there and get their suits made while they're there on business, or they just go there to get their suits made up and then they fly back home. Or they've got trunk shows that go out to New York and Shanghai and different places like that. But my own view on this is that there will always be room for artisanal bespoke tailoring. Limited number of customers perhaps, um, house style, attention to detail, 
and there will always be room for Premark, H&M at the bottom end, Marks and Spencers and people like that at the middle, which it's not that people buy from the chains because they necessarily can't afford or don't know about bespoke. Mm -hmm. I think they also buy from there for, for other reasons. Now, I suspect what you're going to find is that there will start to be a gap and you'll have fewer and fewer people in the middle and the industry, like a lot of things today, will polarize mm -hmm. between the bespoke and the low end. Right. And I think that's what we'll see happening. Interesting. Interesting. Now, from a bias perspective, you know, especially with technology being uh, a disruptive uh, element or disruptive instrument, mm -hmm. how do you see that influencing our buying decisions when it comes to tailoring? Both, okay. both bespoke uh, or, uh, well, both custom-made and ready-to-wear. Sure. And when I say custom-made, uh, it's all-inclusive. So that, sure. means, that means bespoke, you know, made-to-measure. Made-to-measure, uh, sure. Or, sure. you know, made-to-order or whatever. Semi-bespoke. Uh, so, yeah. so these are, how do, you, how do you see the shifting sense of technology influencing mm -hmm. buying decisions um, for both ends of sure. this market, which you described in your closing, okay. in your penultimate statement. Okay, now this is where it gets really interesting because you've got a place like Amazon or, yeah, let's take Amazon as an example. So Amazon makes it possible for me, sitting in my apartment in Abu Dhabi, to order um, T-shirts, boots. I can order any sort of ready-to-wear stuff that I want to. But there's a challenge there. Will it fit? And my wife is a good example of somebody who buys things on Amazon and the next morning, call to the guy, take it back because it's not what you said it was. <laughs> um, if you order shoes on Amazon, when they say it's a size eight, is it really a size eight? Or are you gonna get something that's in fact a size seven? There are all these risks that you take. Now, if you're only paying $20, you can maybe take the risk and it doesn't matter. But if you're paying 200 or 2,000, then you start to get a little bit more careful, don't you? A little bit nervy about what you're going to be ordering. Now imagine, I told you earlier, one of my great, in terms of style, my great examples was George Raff, the actor. Now imagine when I was, say, 15, and I wanted to look like George Raft. There was absolutely no way that was going to happen where I lived, because I could go to a tailor, pay at that time about $400, but I wouldn't have looked like George Raff because the tailor wouldn't have known how to do it. Maybe in Toronto, some of the very old tailors in Cabbage Town could have done it, but the average tailor couldn't do it because he, 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 did, he didn't do it because nobody else wanted to look like George Raft except me. Um, I couldn't find the fabric that I wanted. I certainly couldn't find it in a shop. And unless I taught myself how to make clothes, I was really going to be stuck. Now, this is where the technology of today creates an enormous opportunity for somebody in his 20s or 30s as a customer. And, of course, it creates an enormous opportunity for the seller. Now, if you take Indy Magnoli as an example. So Indy Magnoli is a guy who makes costumes and props for movies. So what did he do? He created some suits, and he, one of them is called the Jake Giddies suit. So if you want to look like Jack Nicholson in Chinatown in the uh, cream-colored suit with the belt back, you can order one from Andy Magnoli. You give him your measurements. It's not really great tailoring. It's not a perfect fit, but yeah, it looks kind of like Jack Nicholson. So right away, enormous choice. And there's Indy Magnoli sitting there in New Zealand. He's got his craftsman sitting in Bangkok, I think, churning out these suits. He's got a line of James Bond suits. So if you just went to see um, Casino Royale and you want to look like Daniel Craig, now, I'm not sure that you actually would, but if you do, then email Indy Magnoli, go onto his website and say, I want the Daniel Craig suit. I'm a size 40. This is my waist. This is my chest. And a couple of weeks later, literally, you'll get it. So there's that possibility. So for the customer, this is enormously liberating. But there's a challenge. Even if you live 
in a city that's fairly well supplied with tailors. Let's say New York, Chicago, San Francisco, uh, Delhi, Bangkok, Manila, and so forth. Can you find a tailor who really knows what kind of cut you want? And the answer is no, because most tailors work to a block, or they work to what they learned in tailoring school, or they work to what seems to be selling in magazines, etc. So here's the opportunity. Customer over here, maker over here. And for the customer, if some wildly eccentric guy like, like myself wants to look like George Raft, finally he can, provided he can find online a tailor who knows, yeah, I know how to make you look like George Raft. OK, great. Or I know how to make you look like Cary Grant, or I know how to make you look like Charlie Watts. Whatever. So in terms of disruption, in the right hands and done ju judiciously by somebody who really knows what's going on, um, you ought to have a game changer if there are enough people who want to be able to do that. Now, it may not be as eccentric as saying, here's the picture from Invisible Stripes or They Drive By Night or something, and make me look like that. But I think most tailors would say, no, 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 seriously, no. But if you said, well, look, I, I want a jacket, and I want it to have a belted back, and I want it in light gray Donegal in 14 ounce. Well, go online and try to find somebody who says, yes, I've got that in my list. It's one of my stock keeping units. No, sorry. Or you say, well, that looks beautiful in gray, but really, do you have it in blue herringbone? No, 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 no. In other words, the customer can have every color he wants as long as it's black, right? So. For, a, for a, an entrepreneur who can figure out a way to give that kind of choice, then uh, I would say, from my own research, which admittedly is not exhaustive, I would say that the, the field is wide open. Excellent, excellent. So, um, so we may be on to something. Wait, who knows? Yes, yes, yes. I hope so. Very as, good. As a customer, I hope so. <laughs> Very good, Pete. So, uh, so let's wrap it up there for clothing and uh, and talk about uh, have a a broad and deep conversation. Okay. Uh, we we'll try to uh, uh, you know we don't have as much time as I as I wished we did. Uh, so it's not going to be one of our six hour marathon right. events. Yes. 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 Uh, yes. But uh, we'll try to touch some points. Sure. Um, the first question uh, is how did you discover or uncover your noose as a man. Um, what were the pillars or, uh, or foundation, as it were, mm -hmm. of your development as, as a man, as an individual, as a man? Um, was the basis of this uh, literature, um, books, movies, uh, some people learn by reading, other people mm -hmm, learn mm -hmm, by watching, mm -hmm, other mm -hmm. people learn by obser observing other people's mm -hmm. lives. Uh, people learn in different ways. Uh, you and I are avid readers, mm -hmm. and so uh, we've learned much of what we know, at least I speak from my own mm -hmm, observation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, of what we know from, from books and literature. Um, but that is only laterly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I'd like to dig a bit farther into your history and find out what was the, the, uh, the genesis of your learning and your discovery or, or, the, okay. or, or the genesis of your path to, to self-discovery as, as an individual as a, and as a man. And then please feel free to speak as broadly as uh, you wish and quote and mm -hmm. reference uh, as widely as you wish, you know, without being too, uh, going too uh, esoteric. Okay. Well, let's see. I think I would say, first of all, uh, the example of my late father was uh, integral to any development that I might have had. So it was by observing him, talking to him, and my late father had, a, he was an engineer, and he had an incredible intolerance for waffling, woolly thinking, nonsense. Um, 
he was a man who saw reality in very, very black and white terms, either as an engineer would. It works or it doesn't work. You know? But he was also extremely well educated. I remember as a student at university uh, learning Greek and practicing for my Greek exams, sitting with my father who 35 years after he had left school remembered enough Greek to be able to read my flashcards and work with me through the vocabulary and through the grammar. And the same thing with Latin. So I would say he probably got me interested in classics, which I still have an interest in. And it was by reading, yes, talking. My mother had an extraordinary interest in, and still has to this day, an extraordinary interest in history and in foreign countries. Uh, a great reader of travel books, very widely read in, in history, but different places, histories of different places. And so there were books around the house by the thousand, which, which I read as a boy. And I think that's where it came from in terms, of, in terms of learning. Now, in terms of how one lives, this is the critical thing, because it's not what you know, it's how, how you, you live, it. how you apply it and how you live. And I've met people who had very little formal education, but lived far more praiseworthy lives than people who had read the equivalent of encyclopedias, myself included, I would, I would add. In terms of how you're going to live and what you're going to do, because ultimately it's about what you do, it's not about what you know, although that can be very useful in informing what you're going to do. Uh, I don't think there's any other way to put it than simply to say that you choose an authority and you follow that authority. In other words, you in the strict sense of the word, you bind yourself to something. Now, what that something is, is a subject for, okay, another day. Yeah, I, I want to interject there. And why I want to interject there, because it's a critical juncture. I, I find you to be a contradiction in some ways. And, and let me explain. Um, I am what you might consider uh, non-religious. Right. Right. Uh, okay. and, and this, is in, I mean, I was brought up in a very religious uh, background or family and, and was so into my early adulthood. And, and uh, as I came into my own self, I chose philosophy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, as I began to <coughs> read more and expose mm -hmm. myself a little bit more to literature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I chose philosophy as sort of my religion. Now, right. from my, you know, in my own observation of you, you're a man of both of the letter and of the faith. Okay. Which I find sometimes puzzling because um, very often people sit in one car camp. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, they're either mm -hmm. highly intellectual, deeply mm -hmm. intellectual, which is almost a synonym for a religious, even atheist. Yes, yes. Yes, I would agree. It can be. If yes. you understand, okay. generally speaking, mm -hmm. you, you know, you find that uh, a lot of people who are highly intellectual um, are, 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 are non are a religious. Mm -hmm. uh, but you seem to be you're 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 Catholic, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that you 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 endear yourself to your Catholic faith mm -hmm. uh, very strongly. But at the same time. Um, you are so widely read. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, you know, how do you marry both? And, and the reason I ask that is this: religion, by necessity, is dogma, right? You may or may not agree with me. I see you sort of like shaking your head. You know, it's okay. At a minimum, it is ideology. At a minimum. Yes, okay. At a minimum, okay. religion is ideology. And intellectualism, in many ways, is anti-ideology, if you understand what I mean. So how do you marry these ideas as a being? How do you marry this uh, belief in, 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 in dogma or religion, which I believe is a form of dogma, with this openness 
of intellectualism. Do you understand the yeah, question? I do. I do indeed, and I'm, I'm racking my brains very, very quickly <laughs> to find an answer. Okay. Let me... Let Never me, any easy questions, Rob. Right, and and <laughs> what, what we have to do in, in about five minutes is, <laughs> is to answer questions that men have spent several thousand years <laughs> trying to answer. So let's, let's go for it, as they say. Okay, first of all, I would suggest that religion is about doing rather than thinking or believing. Although, admittedly, you, you generally think what you do. Otherwise, you, you go absolutely batty because you live in a world of cognitive dissonance. So you have to agree within yourself, at least, that what you're doing is the best thing that you should be doing. But I would argue that religion... Strictly speaking, the word religion, and we have the word in English, ligature, ligament, means literally a cord that binds you. So it binds you to something. Now, you say dogma, that's very true. But I personally would look at it as it's something that you do rather than something that you think. So that leaves you free to read all kinds of things. Now, I can read, uh, you mentioned Xenophon. Okay. Now, I can read Xenophon, and I can find in Xenophon wisdom for the ages, entertainment. I can find Xenophon as a role model. And you were asking me about role models. I would have said, if anybody had the ultimate life, Xenophon, soldier, philosopher, statesman, writer, real Renaissance man, eh? real Renaissance man. So, I would not, however, model my religion, which involves a higher power on Xenophon, because Xenophon was a pagan Greek who didn't understand or didn't know a great deal about religion, and he had, had never encountered revelation and all the rest of it. He was a Greek. So in other words, you, you read a lot because this gives you ideas. Now, nobody said that religion or religious people can't read different things and can't entertain an enormously wide range of ideas. I'll give you an example. St. Jerome, 5th uh, century Roman Empire, uh, translated the Bible into Latin, which is known as the Vulgate, which became the standard edition of the Bible, and, and in some ways still is. St. Jerome lived in a cave in, in Nazareth while he was translating the Bible, speaking to all the, the Hebrews around. But St. Jerome didn't believe that you should have Christian education. He said you should have classical pagan education. Why? Because the classical pagan writers were better writers than the Christian writers were. So he said if you want to learn about writing, go to the guys who did it best, and these were people like Catullus and uh, Ovid and Virgil and, and a lot of them. So if you want to learn about philosophy, read the Greeks. They were wonderful philosophers, but on the other hand, I wouldn't go and ask Plato to write, or, or to, I, I wouldn't go to church and pray to Plato, because I don't actually think that Plato had the kind of divine power that, that one, to whom one needs to pray, if you know what I mean. Does that answer your question? Well, sort of. Okay. Uh, sort of, it, it, it does, but it still doesn't. I'm still trying to heal at something, which I, I, don't think I, I, have, I don't think I've met... Yeah. Well, let me let me uh, continue. I'm successful yet at, but let me I continue mean, for a moment. Uh, yes, go just, ahead. Go just ahead. for a moment here. So, it's a mistake to think that people who have a religion can't have a mind, because after all, um, in my own religion, Catholic religion, some of the most famous people in that religion were extraordinary thinkers and. Thomas Aquinas springs to mind. St. Augustine springs to mind. Extraordinary thinkers in the intellectual tradition of Plato and Aristotle and the rest of it. So you read, you discuss, you look at things, you examine things. There are many aspects of life or the world which, upon which, for example, the Catholic Church does not claim to pronounce. So it doesn't pronounce on the nature of the atom. So you're quite free to study atoms or, or quarks or quasars or electrons, whatever you want. There's nothing religious about that. Um, similarly, the church does not pronounce on suits, thank heaven, okay, because it gives us that liberty. 
what it does pronounce on is what it would consider necessary for faith and morals. But everything else, like whether you should have solar panels or oil refineries, is everything else is, is up to you in the sense that you, you make your decision in your, or your opinion, shall we say, about things on which you can have an opinion, may be informed by your religion. Well, Pete, again, uh, this is a subject for a whole yes, interview. Yes, yes, and, yes. And yes, we yes. will schedule that interview. <laughs> You're not going to get away easy. I'm not going to let okay. you off easy on this one. Okay. But I think, again, just what I'm pointing at or what I'm trying to get at is this, is that religion and intellectualism require, in my view, and you may beg to differ, mm -hmm. um, a completely different mindset. Um, you talked about rules applying to religion, which is true. And when I think about rules, I think about a framework. I think about a mindset. I think about. I think about. How do you put it? A yes. construct. Yes, that's right. Yes. You know, whereas intellectualism, in fact, demands the opposite. Um, yeah, essentially, you know, demands the opposite, and, and I mean that from in terms of sort of from a thinking perspective, ah. because you can't really be, uh, you can't yes. be too caged as an intellectual, right? No, but you, you can't be too caged. So it requires a very open mind. It does, but you still are which going in, to... in 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 truth, religion in some way prohibits. No, I don't think so. Because you can have an open mind in the sense that you can say, okay, there's an idea, let's talk about that. And let's well, discuss that. Doesn't now, mean I believe you. No, 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 but that's... It doesn't mean you believe me, no, you but change but you my see, mind. No, but you yeah. see, you, you, most people's minds, by the way, are not changed by rational, logical argument. Most people's minds are changed by experience. But also, you can say, well, there's an idea, let's think about that. Now, let me give you an example. Um, does the Earth go around the Sun, or does the Sun go around the Earth, right? Okay, so there are various answers to that question. Let's think about that. Now, an open mind would say, well, let's look at the arguments on both sides. You don't you know, commit yourself necessarily to that. Now, if you say, well, let's be intellectual, and let's have a sort of free-ranging mind, but we're still applying rules. We're applying, for example, rules of logic. Okay. We're applying... Or rules of physics. Or rules of physics. Or we're applying moral principles. Now, let me give you another example. Let's talk about slavery. Now, we could have a logical, rational discussion about the slave trade and the economics of slavery and whether it's better to get your slaves from Gabon or from Senegal or from Gambia. And we could have a perfectly technical discussion about that subject. But while we're having that discussion, the audience would start to cringe because they would say, but you're talking about something that's awful. Right, so there's a moral view coming in there right away. But we could have, and no doubt in the past. At an intellectual level. We, we could, at, at a purely rational level. But this is where it gets difficult because nothing in life can be compartmentalized into the purely rational. Take, for example, well, I suppose in a way engineering can be, computer science can be, but let's look at uh, something like the internet or artificial intelligence. And technically, you say, well, isn't that interesting? We could work out ways to find out what everybody's doing all the time. And right away somebody says, ah, but that might be interfering with them. Ah, moral point in there. So I don't know that one is ever 100% open-minded. There's always going to be a part of the person. And that part of the person, if we were purely rational, we'd be like G.K. Chesterton said, an insane man has lost everything except his reason. <laughs> we would literally be mad, I think, if we, if we did that. Or we might be extremely dangerous because we would have no natural human inclination to temper that reason. Does that get closer to... Well, we... I, I, think, I think we're close enough. Like I said, I don't think there's a, I don't think we'll ever... I don't think there's an answer, first of all. But, no, uh, no, It's an okay. interesting subject. It certainly one, is. 
oh, one that I've been uh, waiting to engage you on. But uh, I Thank think, you. like I said, Thank that's you. a subject for a whole interview <laughs> uh, yes, on we'll, philosophy. Yes, and indeed, we'll, yes. we'll punt on that yes, for now. Yes. Um, uh, we are running quite short on time, and so I'd like to sort of touch on a couple things before we uh, bring down the curtain here. Go ahead. Uh, I want to talk about family, yes. and I bring this up for the benefit of a lot of the younger ones, especially yes. the men, yes. Um, yes. who are struggling, uh, and I use the word struggling quite appropriately um, because of the times we live in. Um, you know, dating yeah. relationship oh, yeah. ain't what they used to be oh, as, yeah. as, as we, you know, it ain't what, you know, things ain't what they used to be, but, and they shouldn't be right. You know, life is about evolution mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we've evolved and technology has been part of that process yes, as well. Yes. Uh, and so, uh, we find a lot of young men, um, a lot of them who are interested in classic dress, uh, that a lot of them who are interested in improving themselves. Sure, sure. I think and of that's course, it. classic yes. dress is yes. just one element or yes. one facet yes, it is. of it. Uh, they're also avid readers, you mm -hmm. know, they read philosophy, um, you know, they're interested in finance yes. and economics, all the things sure. we sure. Uh, also. How would you position them, at least sort of position their minds to approach the idea of family in? Our contemporary times okay. um, and let me qualify this uh, there's this new what do they call it a meme is it a meme or what, something um, about young men just sort of going on strike when it comes to marriage mm. uh, and mm. sort of family mm. as a whole yes um, which I find a little bit disturbing mm. if I'm frank mm. what are your thoughts around this especially since you have Daughters who've come of age, mm -hmm. you have a grandson, mm -hmm. and you know you've you've you you you've dealt with this quote unquote as an insider. Okay. What are your thoughts? This uh, topic, by the way, is actually more important than philosophy and reading because it touches on people's lives. What I would say to the younger generation of men is this: the best situation you can have in your life is not necessarily being the manager of a hedge fund. It's when you go home in the evening, do you have a pleasant home with a pleasant wife, with pleasant children, where you can sit and you can be yourself and you don't have to compete? First, never marry somebody with whom you are explicitly or implicitly competing. In other words, one of you has to be the main one wearing, as they say, the pants. <laughs> one of you has to be wearing the pants. Ask Oki pants. Ask Oki pants. <laughs> and that, I'm sorry to say, has to be the man. If that means that, you're, that you find a wife who is a waitress in a Denny's when you meet her. But you can be yourself around her. She understands you and will tolerate your eccentricities, faults, failings, and all the rest of it. Don't pass her up for a lady who's in law school and who comes from Scarsdale or something like that just because she's in law school and comes from Scarsdale. Because at the end of the day, you've got to go home. You've got to sit down and have your supper. You've got your children there. You've got your wife there. And this, by the way, is what successful men have been enjoying since, well, really since Adam. And I think, Oki, you would agree that a pleasant life at home is worth millions in the bank because the alternative is you go home and it's a big pain in the neck, you're arguing, you're yelling, it's exhausting, your kids don't want to talk to you, your wife doesn't want to talk to you, etc. I cannot imagine how hard that would be since I've never experienced that. Now, let me interject there. Um, and what you, what you, your, your prescription makes sense. However, we also have a world where um, 
this uh, is a lot more highly competitive. Yes. Um, yes. The cost of building a family in this day yes. and age is, has gone up astronomically. Yes. Um, gone are the days when you could say, well, just, you know, uh, quote unquote, keep her pregnant and, 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 uh, and barefoot in the kitchen, so to speak. Right. Uh, not to sound misogynistic. Uh, but uh, and that was just a joke, by the way. But gone are the days when you could just sort of say, "Okay, you know, lady, you stay home and and, and keep right. an eye on the kids, and I'm gonna go off into the field." Um, these days, very often, you know, you need both people, literally, hands on the on the uh, plow, on, yes. on the plow, as as they would say. How do you reconcile that? <clears throat> we don't even try to. Because Find what you're finding, and let me say one, what you're finding is that you find this sort of the career mindset. Yeah, oh, yes, right? yes. Oh, yes, And yes. then it makes sense on paper. Yep. But when they try to come together, it's a fucking... It is. No, no, it, it is. Sorry. Uh, forgive my French. <laughs> Leave it that is, out. Uh, yes. It is, uh, it is a desert storm. Yes. No, I honestly believe um, I'm very fortunate. I have my own business. My wife works with me as a consultant in the business. So if we want to go on vacation, we can. She doesn't have to ask her boss for leave. If we want to take a day off and we have time to do that, take our children out or our grandson out, we can do that. So I'm not in a typical situation where I answer to a manager. But if seriously, it's, it's a problem. If you, if you want to depend on two incomes, or you need to depend on two incomes, and you're in your 20s, you're going to find a problem because for you men out there, the little lady, by the time she's around about 30, starts to hear that clock ticking. And she's going to want to and have to take a number of years out of the workforce. Now, I'll give you an example. A very old friend of mine from Canada, a girl I went to university with, studied philosophy, very driven, went to law school, got a job at a top law, uh, corporate law firm in Toronto. Within four years, she was married to another lawyer, and within two years, she quit law, and she's never gone back to it. Why? Because she discovered her vocation as a mother, a wife, and she, looks, she gets involved in art in London. So she busies herself with art galleries, and part-time sort of charitable things. That is what she chose, ultimately. She spent thousands of dollars on her education as a lawyer, was, I'm sure, a very good lawyer. But ultimately, the two-income family is, okay, very difficult. And if you're both working um, in a high-level job, you're going to be both working very long hours, and you're going to come home absolutely flat out. So, so Mr. Mann, you get home from work, having been dealing with options traders or lawyers or whatever it is all day, and what do you want to do? You want to sit down and you want to have somebody to say, here's your beer, dear, or here's your gin and tonic, or here's your tea, or whatever it is you want, right? And your wife comes home, and what does she want to do? She wants to sit down. She doesn't want to cook dinner. So I suppose you could hire a cook. But then you're starting to defeat the purpose of having two incomes. So I think you've really got to think carefully about that and think to yourself, maybe we'll both work for a couple of years, save some money, but ultimately, there's got to be one breadwinner. And the men, if they don't, if they are not the breadwinner, it's, it's, it's been found psychologically that there are prob they have mental problems. Not, I don't mean they go insane, but it's much better for a man's mental well-being to have the satisfaction of he supports the family. And if you have to give up the second BMW, or those weekly trips to Hawaii, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. well, maybe they weren't really that's worth true. having at the expense of your life. I don't know if that sounds too... I don't want to sound like I'm preaching a gospel here, okay? but that's my own experience. Very well, Pete. Um, many would uh, consider your views, um, uh, I suppose, the, in, the, the, in, the, in the modern liberal church, yeah, they might consider it a bit patriarchal? Oh, I'm sure they would. I, I'm not claiming to be um, 
in, in fashion in this regard. It's just from what I've experienced and what I've seen among people around me and what I've read. Now, how do you think your liberal daughter would re react to your, your, you know, your idea around this? Or your modern, your or your daughter who's been raised in this modern sort of um, liberal. Uh, they would both be extremely happy to be married to somebody who's reliable, who at the expense of their own careers. Well, as it were, they could have careers in the sense of they can always do it on the weekends or part-time basis, but. The idea of being a wife and a mother and being able to do things in the home, look after the children. This is a very, very powerful vocation for women. And we, we ignore it, I think, at our peril. And cities are full of ladies, aged 50, living alone with two cats, at, who, who missed the boat. You know, and I, I don't know, I don't claim to speak for the female sex here, Oki, I, I, I can't, but I would say both my daughters, yes, they're very keen on what they do, but were they to meet uh, suitable people? Well, my, my oldest daughter has done, obviously, but w w let's be hypothetical here. Were they to meet stable men who buy, ask Oki pants, smoke cigars, um, do various <laughs> interesting things, um, I'm sure they would be quite content just to settle down. Very well, Pete. Um, we could go on and on, but uh, unfortunately, we're limited uh, by yes, time, yes, and indeed, we yes, have to yes. bring the curtains down okay. uh, shortly. And uh, in conclusion, Pete, um, share with us a few words of wisdom. Um, I come to you uh, not infrequently for uh, these types of mm. uh, words, uh, encouraging words. I call it intellectual soccer. Right. Um, I would like for you to share with the audience, just in a few, uh, in a paragraph or two, what your parting uh, words of wisdom. Golly, okay. Well, first thing, obviously, is you've got to know yourself. You've got to know what you can do and, more importantly, what you can't do. And don't try to do what you can't do. Second... The film director, Jack Layton, famously said, never get good at anything you don't want to do. So if you don't want to do something, don't spend years trying to master it because it's a waste of time. Third, if you want to meet a tennis player, go to a tennis court. Not to a bar. Don't, don't go to a bar <laughs> if you want to meet a tennis player. And I think that's for the younger <laughs> fellows here. And, and okay, that's uh, on, off the top of my head all I can say. Very well, very well, Pete. Pete, uh, as always, um, never a dull moment with you. Thank never you. a dull Thank moment. You. And uh, very, very as I said decision. in the beginning, um, ladies and gentlemen, you can tell from the exchange that, uh, that when we get going, we get going. We and do we indeed. Could, we yes. could really go back and forth, Pete and yes, I. Yes, we could. Uh, uh, for hours. And yeah. we. Yep. Haven't even referenced books. On no, we haven't. No, we haven't even um, started I, yet. I, okay, I, no. I, I spared yeah. the audience that, but ooh, uh, ooh. but I will, we'll have you back again. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. and uh, during that session, we can dig deeper into some of the books we've mm. we've read together um, and just sort of get a bit deeper into Indeed. sort of the different Indeed, yes. uh, different silos. So Look forward with to that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I say thank you once more uh, for sitting in for yet another edition of uh, Ask Oki Life. And um, Pete, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. As always, it's been a great pleasure. Great pleasure, Oki. And great pleasure. Um, yep. we look forward to having you back in Studio One. Thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, and thank you for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Oki. Goodbye. Goodbye.